Sorry, Speaker. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, today is it's the beginning of the budget process, and obviously we heard the governor's uh, broad strokes on what the budget is going to be. But I first have to set the record straight on a few things that there was a lot of numbers and a lot of things that were talked about there. Um, and listen, numbers normally add up, but you can paint them to look whatever you can. And also, you know, so people sometimes do a good job of misleading people. So I gotta, I gotta set the record straight on a few things. When we talk about the TTF, something we didn't hear about in the state of the state, he talked about it now. He talks about it that he tried to get it done a year ago, but he could not get it done because of this legislature. That's not factual. And, you know, he was running for a different office at that point in time. He talked about that it has to be tax fairness. That's a word that each and every one of you have heard from me for the last probably two years of talking about how do we do this, of working together. So I am ready to work together with him. But when you start talking about certain things and you talk about that he inherited an $11 billion structural deficit and now you have an $800 million surplus, that's not, that's not accurate. That's not accurate because he came in with a 300 million surplus, which was very small for the size, but we have a $10.2 billion structural deficit today. So that's not accurate. So TTF is important. When you look at this TTF, it was literally borrowed every penny. It's the worst in the history of New Jersey, the most reliance on borrowing. Our state debt is the highest ever, over $35 billion. So when you talk about accomplishments, you know, sometimes you, you forget about talking about some of the other things. I did hear a lot of things about, you know, hopefully poverty and helping people, but he neglected also to say under his watch we have the most amount of children in poverty, over 800,000. When you talk about the pension, and he talks about the pension and what that would mean about paying the constitutional amendment we did. The reason we had to do that, because numbers do add up, but people always don't do the right thing, and we have to do it. And when he talks about 10% uh, increase in sales tax, 23% at every uh, level that he said that everybody raised their hands, no, but that's not a factual number. It also, in that plan, it incorporates what I've been talking about, a phase in over five years. Year one is the amount that's being paid in this year, and then it's four eights, then five eights. So it's actually phased in so you can have growth being able to take care of that. So that's not the problem. So the issue that he's misleading people, when he talks about how many people moved out of the state, he forgets to tell you how many people have moved into the state. That is about the same number. Also, we look at, uh, we export the most students every year to about 30,000 leave the state. Why? Because they can't afford the affordability of college here. And normally when they leave, they don't come here. So we have a lot of challenges that we need to do, but the record has to be straight. The pension, when we talk about funding it and the way he talks about it, each and every one of you thinks or understands that this commission says that you're going to do through cost savings $2 billion and it's going to fix the pension. That's not what that commission says. They want to take that pension away. It's going to freeze it wherever you are today. So those employees that have vested their time now are not going to have their pension. It's going to be a new thing, a cash balance. That's not, that's not what they're portraying. When they're telling you that you're gonna take $810 million from the state and now you're gonna punt it over to municipalities, that municipalities are going to have that burden on them that potentially, if there's no savings on the health benefits of their public employees, to offset that, that would be direct tax height. Who would want to take that at, at hand? Now, if you would tell me that you were gonna try and get savings from your employees and, and deliver property tax relief, that's something that people can look at, but the state's obligation, punting it off to the municipalities, that's not acceptable. This budget, as we'll look at the details, it, it, in whole, it is a budget that we'll look at, see how we can work with, with him to do all these things. But I had to set the record straight because sitting back behind there and hearing things that you've been talking about all along this for the last two years and things that we're trying to do, especially with the TTF that I'm very passionate about, that when you hear that, oh, we couldn't get it done because we were on the, on the ballot, that's not accurate. That actually, I said, everybody does it together 
there's no problem. But guess what? He didn't talk about the TTF, the, uh, at the state of the state. He talked about repealing the estate tax. Why? Because he wanted to talk about a tax decrease, not a tax increase, potentially, even though that there would be tax fairness. So, again, I'm always willing to work, and everybody in this room knows me, that I will roll up my sleeves and make sure we do the right thing under the leadership of Assemblyman Gary Scher and the Budget Committee. The process will start. And now we will go line by line, seeing what's in this budget, and obviously the, the devil's in the details. The $250 million, the things that he talked about, those are some of the things that common sense, but is that all there is? He talked about three items in it. We'll look, definitely look at that, see how that works, and see what we can do. So I look forward to the beginning of the process, and like again, it is the beginning of the process. And I look forward to getting to a budget that is balanced, and for everybody's here, every governor has given a balanced budget. It's in the Constitution. Majority Leader Greenwald. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> so today is, as always is the case historically, today is day one of the process. And the budget today is passed from the governor's office to us, and we will begin the process under the stewardship of our chairman, Gary Scher, to leave our imprint on this process. <laughs> Uh, we will begin to dissect the details of what the budget is. We will begin to uh, hopefully hear from the public. We take this opportunity first and foremost that we hope the public weighs in. We hope that the public weighs in with the impact this budget has on their lives, on their industries, so that we have an understanding of the problems that need to be solved. Um, the reality is that for us, uh, as I listen to the governor speak, I am encouraged by uh, what I've heard for the first time in a long time, a willingness to work together and an acknowledgement of the things that we have done in the past. That being said, there are factual inaccuracies uh, in the governor's speech that I appreciate the governor standing up and saying facts matter. They do matter. And the facts are that nobody in the administration was talking about the need to address the Transportation Trust Fund until our speaker stood boldly and proudly and courageously and said, this must get addressed. No one, the speaker, no one has ever suggested that the only way to solve this is through a tax hike alone. There has been tremendous talk around national standards, industry standards, pay-as-you-go standards, offsetting this with uh, making New Jersey competitive from a tax standpoint with the inheritance and the estate tax. But that being said, the governor can't ignore the fact that New Jersey is ranked as the second worst tax state in the country second only to New York. And what's interesting, I share his concern about the exodus of residents between the ages of 18 and 34 that are leaving the state. One of the great ironies, as the governor pointed out, is the two most favorite states of those people are Pennsylvania and New York. Many residents are leaving New Jersey to go to the highest tax state in the country in New York. Now, I think that's an outlier skewed by the city itself and changing those demographics, but it sends a very clear message that we are out of touch. And what you've heard many of us talk about for years is that New Jersey's tax policy are outdated and antiquated. And the truth of the matter is, if we want to seize upon some of the good news that's happened over the last decade with this governor and bipartisan support, referencing New Jersey ranked 10th uh, in research and development, eighth in productivity, fifth in high tech density, 15th in STEM concentration, 13th in science and engineering degree holders, and seventh in patent activity, putting us fourth out of 50 states on the innovation index. That is an important statistic that if we fail to invest in our infrastructure, if we fail to change our opportunity to make New Jersey competitive from a tax base, that will be short lived. One of the things that we can do first and foremost that we have passed to this governor is an opportunity to deal with pay equity. 40 percent of uh, 40 years, I'm sorry, I apologize. A recent study out of Washington indicates that a report from the Institute for Women's Policy Research projects that we will not be able to close the pay gap between men and women for the next 40 years. Women are highly educated, they have experience and are well qualified in two thirds of New Jersey families depend on a women's paycheck for financial security. If you want to stimulate our economy, close that gap. Take advantage of our place as fourth in the country for creativity and in this tech, new tech society <coughs> to take an opportunity to equal that pay gap and to make a significant and dramatic difference. We have never not worked with this governor. We have not always agreed. 
but we have never not worked with this governor. And our position will be, as our constitutional requirement is, to work with this governor. But we must have an understanding that we can't just stand up and say that we've closed an $11 billion deficit when the truth of the matter is on one issue alone, on pensions, we have billions of dollars in remaining deficit. The failure to close that deficit, the failure to live up to that obligation has resulted in nine downgrades in a row in a historic level in New Jersey. We can't ignore a factual, a factual statement that we have a deficit in our transportation trust fund and that we run out of money in July and that that has to get addressed and that is a billion dollar problem. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, I'm sure the speaker will, will entertain questions. I want to turn it over to our yes. budget chairman, Gary Scher. Thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, as always. Um, it's a pleasure to join with my colleagues and to address you this afternoon. Um, very briefly, if I may, I think the governor's speech was notable in several respects, both in what was said as well as that which was not addressed. Specifically, as the Speaker and the Majority Leader mentioned, Transportation Trust Fund, which many of us would argue is the most important uh, project of this state in terms of providing not only jobs but our economic infrastructure, was unaddressed. Atlantic City and the crisis which that municipality is encountering for any number of reasons was not addressed. Victims from Hurricane Sandy who after all these years still remain victims without funds going to them and them being not able to sustain themselves where they are in New Jersey, unaddressed. So children living in extraordinary poverty, unaddressed. The inaffordability of New Jersey for so many of our families making $8.38 an hour and in some cases even less. The governor's speech handled several areas, certainly in the budget committee, um, looks forward to dealing with those areas and many others as well. But I think that we need to understand what was not addressed as well. The $250 million in savings from health savings which the governor proposed was not defined. We have no idea where it's coming from um, except from generalities. $60 million a total, $20 million from the state, $40 million match from the feds for the, uh, for the GME is an extraordinary attractive figure, but again, Below the surface, as the governor said, we must examine, we must examine why 70% of all graduates of GME leave the state of New Jersey. Ten years ago, 50% did. We're losing more and more people to the GME who have taken benefit from the state's largesse, and those funds are leaving us. And of course, whenever we talk about out-migration, as both the speaker and majority leader mentioned during their brief remarks, we need to understand also how we expect to keep kids in New Jersey when we are amongst the three lowest states that gives money to higher education and children are graduating from college and university to three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. So these become the questions which uh, the budget committee of this assembly looks forward to tackling and Mr. Speaker, Mr. Majority Leader, I thank you for appointing a budget committee of such strength and character and resolve and we look forward under your joint leadership uh, to progressing in the future. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I feel rather odd standing before you. It's been six years, and I actually went up and shook the governor's hands to say to him, I'm proud to hear you're talking about the poor, you're talking about housing. I've been in this house now over 20 years. We have had about four or five hearings, and under the leadership of our speaker, this is the first time I really feel comfortable that we're going to deal with this particular issue. So he mentioned it, but the reality, it is for real. A state of this size to have people moving out is not because the government, it's because they can't afford to live <clears throat> in this state as well as the children can't come back to live in the state. He said a whole lot. And maybe if he'd have said this here six years ago, things would be a lot more different. But I'd like to feel under the leadership we have dealing with the budget, we're going to be able to separate the real rural from the other rural. Because as a person who's very much involved in Union County, there's not a town in Union County that's not hurting for <coughs> multiple reasons. So when you talk about the fact that we're okay with transportation, we're okay with education, I'm confident 
that we will find out whether his numbers are for real or not. Can we do this? Because if we can't, then we're going to have to start thinking about what's going to happen two years from now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I echo the sentiments, of course, of leadership. Um, and we've been working. Uh, the governor mentioned that he's ready to work with us. Uh, so that is exciting. Uh, it's exciting, of course, to know the changes and reforms that have happened in the behavioral health care sector, uh, saving thousands of lives with the Narcan drug. Uh, but we still have a ways to go. I'm looking forward to the budget hearings where we will talk about what else is needed for the addiction population to actually access treatment and how those dollars will be spent. I'm excited to hear that there's concern for the distressed cities uh, in our state that funding, additional funding should be allocated towards those needs. And I'm also looking forward to hearing the conversation on a robust funding solution for our education system, both for our public education, school systems, K through 12, as well as college education. Our children are leaving the state when they hit 18 because it's cheaper to receive your education out of the state. You're talking about leaving with 100 plus thousand dollars in debt, as was mentioned. So we really need to look, take a hard look at our state, look at where we're allocating our resources, look at what our funding priorities are, and roll up our sleeves as we have been doing in the legislature, and having a governor who's now here and ready to come back to work. Vinny, we'll some on the TTF, yeah. um, the governor said it's not a problem we can solve in a vacuum. He referenced the fact that he didn't feel that we could only do this by raising the, the gas tax, presumably. What's your takeaway on this? I mean, <clears throat> it sounded like he was kind of signaling there's room for discussion and debate yeah. and negotiation or he, not. He ba basically, what, what I heard is, um, uh, you know, the negotiations has been there, and we had talked about tax fairness, as I said. The, the issue is that he's making light of it. He actually did that while well, he was in New Hampshire, but the, the fact is, in July 1st, there is not one more cent for it. You would either have to borrow again. And again, the majority leader said, we have had nine downgradings. It costs us more to borrow. So can you glue together the transportation trust fund for, for another two years until it's gone? Yeah, probably, but he's saying about having a, a, uh, a plan presented. We actually have, have already have had those discussions. So it's disingenuous when you talk about it, like if this has not been talked about, it was only broad strokes, which is not accurate. But do you feel that there's room to negotiate now yeah. moving forward? Uh, well, listen, I'm always willing to negotiate. And that's why, because the state of New Jersey, this is too much of an important issue. I have said this is the first you know, domino that we need to topple over to take care of all the other problems. Without this, nothing happens. If you don't fund this, you then have problems, the money that goes to municipalities to resurface roads. Last year was about $264 million. You can't, you, you can't burden these towns with that because it would be property tax hike. What is your reaction David? to, um, you know, okay. he said that you guys walked away from discussions because of the election. Uh, I, I, I was probably hotter than a back, baked potato back there, to be honest with you, because that is that's one of the first things that I talked about here. That is not, and every one of you has heard from me, it was all of us jumping off the cliff together, be creating tax fairness, getting it done. But, you know, he was actually running for another office. So, you know, that's not, that's not accurate, you know, what he actually said. David? He says, uh, the governor says that the fact that you guys say that TTF is running out of money. It's a politically driven mischaracterization. What is he missing? I, I, I don't know. I guess he's not looking at the books, and he's not listening to, I guess, the, the people that, that should be talking to him, because at the end of the day, this TTF runs out June 30th. This TTF, which was supposed to have a large component of PAYGO, literally, you know, was $1.8 billion. He's borrowed every penny. So I don't know what he's talking about, and that's why that's not accurate facts. That he's talking. Speaker, there's been a couple of veiled references to it here, but what is the effect, or not effect at all, of working with the governor on a budget that's no longer running for president? I mean, do you feel like you might be able to get more concessions? Will you have the majority leader kind of reference the fact that more working? Yeah. Well, he says he wants to work together. We've been here all along to work together. We, you know, we're not the ones that have been 72 percent of last year out of the state. We've been here, and we welcome the dialogue with him, and we want to work with him. And like I said to you, when you look at this budget as a whole, you know, listen, we can work with that. 
and see what we have there. But, you know, TTF is one that we have to do. And some of the things that he's talked about, like the pension payment and all those things, those are things that were misleading, and he left things, he omitted things. But, do you think, but, but on that, do you think that maybe you can get more concessions in areas where I, I, listen, I, when we would talk before, that was on the table. A gas tax was on the table. So, you know, that was always here. But I guess I always said, we got to wait till he comes back. I look forward to that debate, and I think we can get to a compromise. Would you take the deal of the, I, sorry if I missed this, the deal for the state tax cut for gas tax increase? That, 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 Tom, that has been on the table. We have talked about that from before. And everybody that talks about here that he says that it was only a gas tax, that's, that's not factual. That's an outright lie. You know, because I got to tell you, you know, we've been talking about tax fairness. That word that he said, you have heard it from me. So, of course, we'll, we'll work on that together. Yeah, what, what, what his four, I think is four tenths that it's in this budget is $1.9 million. That is the first, when I had talked about a five year phase in, that was year one. Year two is two points, you know, two point something billion. That's why when he talks about tax hikes of the magnitude he talks about, they're not realistic because it's phased in over a five year period. So that's exactly what we've been talking about. Yes, Al. Well, it, it, it would have to be together. It would have to be in one bill together. And what we had always talked about was some type of phase out so then we could absorb the blow. Because remember, they're two different animals, the TTF and the state budget. And when, you know, the uh, chairman here will tell you, a $400 million hole year one would be difficult. So we'll see how we can try and phase it in. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, back to pensions. Uh, that $1.9 billion contribution seems to hinge on acceptance of the $247 million in health care benefit reduction. Well, the, the $250 million that he talked about are in the budget, and those he's already calculating. If we don't like it or can't do them, then we would have to find $250 million to, to offset that. Uh, Matt? Uh, who do you blame for the talks on the TTF falling through a couple years ago? I mean, he obviously put the blame completely on you. Who do you blame? Who do I blame? The guy that was telling you that story, you know? Well, in terms of... You know, it, it, would, it wasn't able to get done. We wanted to get it done, and I wanted everybody to come together. But there was, the legislature was running, and he had other, other ideas. And I, and I had said, everybody has to come together. We weren't going to put out a plan out there that we were going to be raising these taxes. That, that, that would have been ludicrous. And listen, I tell all you guys, there's policy and politics, and they're intertwined. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, coming here and preaching to you that this was something that was an easy thing to do, but it was a thing to do to together because it was that important. Mr. Speaker, may I on that point? Yeah, absolutely. Matt, the Senate and the Assembly, just like we do on every budget, the Senate and the Assembly agreed on a policy to fund the Transportation Trust Fund. We worked with experts in the field. We came up with a national standard, an industry standard. We presented a multi-year proposal to the governor. We had talked about uh, a phase out of the inheritance and estate tax. The reaction from the administration was no, and that's where it left. There was no counteroffer. In any deal we've ever done, there's give and take. The reaction was no. Yeah. And, and, yeah. How do you feel about another year of flat homestead property tax relief benefits? You know, it, it, it's difficult because, you know, you would want to get some property tax relief to, to the residents. That's why we need to get other things done to be able to have the revenues that the state needs. And I said, you know, uh, many, many times, uh, standing here before you, we have a revenue problem in the state. And that, you know, listen, when you, t when you saw candidate Christie back six years ago, he actually was going to, you know, grow those, those rebates and actually they were slashed. And unfortunately, times got tough. So, you know, the economy's getting better. We have, we have to get better. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's 75 million state. It's matched by the federal. What the argument with that is that um, 
that this is what the administration will tell you. More people are in the Affordable Care Act. There's, you know, um, less charity care. So we'll look at that. Obviously, that's something that the budget chairman will vet through the process and hearing from the hospitals and get, you know, actually the key stakeholders and those experts to give us their thoughts. Okay, one more question, guys. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify, so do you see that the, the proposed pension contribution is, is sufficient or not? Well, it's, it's what we are actually have uh, was on, I guess, in line with what he paid last year. And for us, it makes sense moving forward if we keep that together with what we put in the plan of phasing it in over five years. That would be basically payment one, and we would have full funding within five years, which we could achieve with uh, natural growth in our budget. All right? Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.